Good afternoon. Welcome to the Committee on Energy and Utilities Finance and Policy. Today is February 13th. Just remember, folks, tomorrow is a special day for you husbands. Make sure you do go out and do what you need to do or you'll be in the doghouse. Mr. Chair. <laughs> With that, especially you, Senator Matthews, you're a youngster to this thing. I've been told, Senator Matthews, you're supposed to increase the number of roses by one every year, but that's just, a, that's just something I've heard. So, um, With that, members, we have one item on the agenda, Senate File 1456. This is the bill that was remanded back out of finance on the floor on Tuesday uh, to sort of set the ground rules uh, for this hearing. Uh, we will turn it over to Senator Senjum. He does have a delete all that he would like to offer to get the bill in the shape that he would like it. It's technically not an author's amendment because uh, the bill did exit this committee. It's back in committee, though he is an author and he's a, putting forth the amendment. Uh, then we will take uh, comments, discussion from the uh, body. Uh, we will take amendments today as well as next Thursday. It is the plan to hear uh, amendments from members, discussion from members. Uh, if there are amendments and there needs to be some level of testimony, we will hear uh, at least a, uh, some of that. I would hope that some of the amendments um, are non-controversial. Uh, if they are controversial, we will hear at least some uh, discussion on it. For folks that do want to discuss the amendments that come up, you certainly may send us in writing your comments. We will include it in the next packet of information for our hearing on the 20, 20th. Uh, 20th, uh, we will bring this bill back up after the confirmation hearing for PUC Commissioner mean, Means and bring this up again for further discussion and the pleasure of the committee whether they want to forward this to finance. So, unless there are further questions from members, we will begin. Uh, Senator Senjim, Senate File 1456. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members, and uh, it's a pleasure once again to be here. Uh, this has been certainly uh, a work to some extent in motion as we've uh, worked to uh, polish and hone this bill into, uh, into hopefully more workable form as uh, issues have arisen. I think I just want to maybe start, maybe not so much for the committee, but just in a minute or so for the, for the television audience, uh, I believe there is one, uh, to talk a little bit about clean energy first and, and how it works. And it's a rather simple concept, uh, and it simply says that as utilities go forward uh, and per address the Public Utilities Commission in Minnesota about the need for more energy relative to either the uh, discontinuous of existing facilities or perhaps even uh, growth in, in people in Minnesota, does they approach a public utilities commission that they need to think about it first from the standpoint of a, a clean energy option. And uh, that clean energy option is defined at least in this bill as anything like nuclear, solar, wind, hydro, carbon sequestration, uh, which is a, a clean technology, municipal solid waste, and uh, even geothermal. So those kind of options would be the options that a public, uh, pardon me, a utility would need to, uh, 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 frankly, go to the Public Utilities Commission uh, with their first options. And if those options don't work from the standpoint of affordability and or reliability, then uh, the option for fossil fuel continuance uh, can be provided by the Public Utilities Commission. In addition to that, as uh, plants do close, and as we think about uh, the plant closure over the next 20 years, uh, we know at least from the data we've been provided that uh, a good number of our utility plants in Minnesota will, will close over the next 20 years, and that's not a, lot of, that's not a long time, uh, that uh, this bill actually then provides support services to those communities uh, along the lines of uh, working with them, the state of Minnesota working with them to make it through what would be, a, frankly, a difficult time. We all know that from the standpoint of uh, the dependence that uh, utilities actually, they don't necessarily impose, but uh, local communities by virtue of tax base and so on are very uh, subject to, uh, uh, frankly, liking these public utility sites within their, within their boundaries such that uh, they do provide a lot of asset, uh, not only from the standpoint of employment, but certainly from the standpoint of uh, 
of, uh, of property tax base. And then uh, this bill also deals with transmission. We can't move into renewable energy future without uh, considering additional transmission in Minnesota. We know that by virtue of a hearing we had last week. And then uh, maximizing local workers. Uh, this bill uh, would provide that uh, as people uh, come on scene to develop this new, if you will, renewable technology, that uh, local workers would be uh, uh, the, uh, if you will, the, the, the approach that's taken with respect to, to that. Uh, I, I personally know that uh, as I've visited sites in my area of the state, uh, not infrequently to see license plates from Texas and California and so on. Uh, uh, those workers are migrating up here to work. Well, this, this, would, uh, this would necessitate that local workers, the bill defines within 150 miles, be employed at these sites. So that's the essence of the bill. Maybe what I think I want to do is just uh, introduce at this point, uh, maybe, and maybe just touch on the reasons. Why, so why am I doing this? I think we all know public attitudes with respect to energy have changed. Uh, climate change is a big issue for many people in our state. The economics of energy have changed. Uh, uh, wind and solar is maybe about the cheapest kilowatt you can produce nowadays. And then about, I've talked about the retirements of plants. I, I, I do th think an energy committee in 2020 has to consider about how we're going to move forward within the next two decades uh, to, in fact, uh, make sure that uh, Minnesota has provided the, the kind of power it needs to uh, economically and otherwise uh, uh, move our state forward. So that's pretty simple. So why don't I, Mr. Chair, then now move the uh, A-17 amendment, uh, and that's an amendment to the uh, uh, Senate file 1456, uh, if I could. Uh, Make that motion, and uh, we'll see where it goes. Senator Sengem moves the A-17 amendment. This is a delete all member uh, uh, amendment members. Uh, gets it into the form for our discussion. Is there any further discussion right now to the A-17 as written? Seeing none, all those in favor of the A-17 signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Senator Sengem. Uh, with that, then, I would like to move one more amendment, and uh, that would be... Uh, the A38 amendment, if you have it. She's getting it. Pages are going to hand out the A38. You said 38. Mm -hmm. The A38 amendment. So as it's being passed out for the in the interest of time, sure. Senator Sengem to yeah. the A38 amendment. So, uh, Mr. Chair and members, as we've gotten into this conversation, uh, there is uh, there has been. Uh, uh, and perhaps will be uh, a lot of discussion about uh, uh, cost of service and how uh, uh, what the what the rates are in Minnesota today, how they got that way, and so what we want to do is ask the Public Utilities Commission, in concert with the Department of Commerce, to take a look at uh, where we have been on rates, uh, in particular in our so-called energy-intensive trade-exposed customers. Uh, a good number of those are in northeastern uh, Minnesota to take a look at, again, where we have been, what the facts are, and to have those reports, uh, uh, that to have the report on those facts sent back to this, uh, this body, and uh, particularly the, you know, the relative chairs of each uh, committee. So uh, I think by virtue of the fact that we've had a lot of discussion about rates, and frankly, whether or not renewable energy is, uh, is uh, going to be something that increases rates or not increases rates, what's increased rates in the past if there are, have been rate increases, this particular amendment uh, strives to uh, take a deeper look into that, and I think it's important from the standpoint of moving forward that we do that. So uh, I offer this, and it's been moved. Thank you, Senator Senjum. Uh, when we're working on amendments today, members, I'm going to offer to put uh, have 10 minutes worth of discussion from or testifiers from the audience, at which point we'll bring it back to the committee. Um, I'm hoping we do not uh, exhaust too much time on amendments at this point. I guess I would also leave it to the author if there's an amendment from the Senate panel, if they wanted to take some testimony, but I will limit to 10 minutes so we can keep moving through this, uh, this meeting. Uh, again, members, uh, People are encouraged if there's an amendment uh, in the audience that if uh, they want to uh, discuss the amendment, they can certainly send our, uh, your comments in writing. It will be provided in the next packet. Um, but I do want to keep uh, at least have some guide rails on how much discussion we have. Um, Senator, your pen went up first. Oh. Senator Marty. Mr. Chair, have you uh, 
We moved the amendment. Have you approved? Oh, well, I did put. Uh, we didn't vote on it yet. We're in discussion. Okay. Senator Marty, A38 on the A38. Mr. A17 has been adopted. Mr. Chair, Senator Senjum, yeah, this looks like you're replacing the cost of service requirement with a study of cost of service simply. Yeah. I, I think that's a good move. I think the cost of service language was very troubling and yeah. um, studying it's a good idea. Further discussion, Senator Dibble? Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and I agree with Senator Marty because um, I had some concerns with uh, the language of Section 1. Had an amendment. Now I don't have to offer it if this is adopted. It's good news. Um, but I do have a question about the A38, uh, Senator Senjum. Um, I see that um, the focus is on helping the energy intensive trade exposed customers, um, but I don't see any mention of particularly the implications for whatever the outcome of the study might be for uh, low income uh, res residential customers, for example. So. Um, I don't necessarily need you to respond at this moment. Don't have an amendment ready for this amendment, but I'm hoping we can at least make sure. I mean, I, I see that we're looking at the cost allocation between residential, commercial, industrial, and energy intensive. Uh, but the concern that's, that there has been all along as, as we try to address the issues of the energy intensive trade exposed customers is the cost shift, uh, particularly as relates to Residential, the residential customer base and particularly low income customers. So I hope we can at some point in the future return to this study to make sure that we're duly considering those customers. Senator, I would just say Senator as this study, the intent of this was to, you know, certainly not exclude that, but to better understand this whole, this whole scenario with respect to rates amongst the relative classes. And so I would just say at least for today as this report comes back and as it gets studied and discussed, uh, if, if that information's not there, I think it's, it's important that we pursue it. So I, I don't know how to answer your question today, but it was not by intent to exclude your point. Right. Senator Dibble? Sounds like you kind of agree with me, so maybe we can work on some language for comfort's sake at some point in the future. Senator Simonson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I just want to make sure that I understood what you said. Did you say you were going to take up to 10 minutes of public testimony, or did I misunderstand that? Up to 10 minutes per item, uh, per amendment. At this um, time? At this time. I haven't opened that yet, but I will open it as soon as we're sort of done discussing that up front, and then open it to 10 minutes, and then bring it back to us for final comments and discussion whether we want to adopt the amendment or not. Keep in, of course, keep in mind, you were, you, both of us were at both of the hearings. We've had multiple hours already of discussion on the global bill itself, so I'm trying to stick to the amendments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that. Uh, Senator Senjum, I'll just have one question, and then I would hope that uh, we could open it up <clears throat> for testimony from the audience. If, if anybody is out there that's actually from northern Minnesota or from an uh, uh, energy-intensive trade-exposed um, business that we could perhaps hear from them. But Senator Senjum, <clears throat> this, uh, I know this is a contentious issue and uh, I appreciate uh, what you're trying to do here, but I, I think it changes the intent uh, <clears throat> for a lot of folks that perhaps want to define this uh, cost of service language as, as the middle ground. Uh, we've come a long way from what was in the A16, uh, but I'm just curious where this amendment came from because this is the first that I've seen of it. Okay. Uh, Senator St. Jim? Uh, it's rather original, actually. I mean, understanding what the concerns were and trying to under, you know, what are, you know, what are the facts? And it's simply that simple. What are the facts? And uh, the facts will help us drive, I think, better decisions in the future. So it's that original, uh, Senator Simonson. Uh, it's <laughs> Any further discussion from members? Seeing not up, oh, Senator Marty? Mr. Chair, I just wanted to say that um, Senator Dibble mentioned, let's make sure we're being careful about impact on low-income customers. I, I believe a couple of years ago, or a year ago, with uh, one of the proposals for uh, with um, cost of service that Minnesota Power put out a thing saying it could have an impact of 50% increases on residential customers and small decreases for the large industrials. And again, that's the kind of thing Yes, we should look at how we can help the energy intensive trade exposed customers, but let's not do it in a way that's really going to hammer everybody else. So 
I think the study is a wise thing to do at this point, but Senator Dibble is right. Let's make sure we look at all of the impacts. Seeing no further comments from members, I'll start the 10 minutes. Uh, any, mem any individual in the audience that would like to speak for or against this amendment, please come to the uh, podium. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Sure. My name is Kelsey Johnson. I'm president of the Iron Mining Association of Minnesota, and I represent the largest industry in northeastern Minnesota, also one of the largest consumers of energy in the state. Um, we consume, on average, 600 megawatts an hour, and... Um, we have to have that base load 100% of the time. Um, I really appreciate the A38 amendment. I think this cost of service allocation evaluation is very important, and it's a, an important step in the right direction. Um, we've seen our rates rise 60% since 2007, and that has come at the cost of our competitiveness. For those of you who we've talked to yet today, we're about 2% of the global marketplace uh, as we stand today when it comes to the production of iron ore. So as we move forward, we would like to continue to um, be as competitive as possible. And it's really important, I think, that the state and the Public Utilities Commission recognize the value of energy intensive trade exposed industries like ours. Um, also in your packets, I know you were provided with some information from one of our member companies. It kind of outlines uh, a number of different things and I'm gonna leave it to my colleague, Peter Larson, to discuss um, some of those uh, things in your, in your packets. Questions to this testifier from members? Seeing none. Next testifier, please. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Senator, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Peter Larson. I'm from the Larkin Hoffman Law Firm, and I'm here representing U.S. Steel. Uh, I um, was asked to include this in your packet. I think you've got a color copy of this in your packet. Um, for those of you who have been around for a while, this will look very similar to the presentation that we made uh, in 2015 when the energy intensive trade exposed language was discussed. And um, we just want to make sure that you have information in front of you about the trends uh, for Minnesota ore operations and our electric rates. Um, you can see if you have the package. Um, the first page is just to give you some context on iron ore prices. You can see that that's actually from a third party and it shows iron ore prices dropping quite significantly in a trend downward. One of the reasons we use this third party is, some of you might know this from our previous discussions, that Minnesota produces about 2% of the global iron units. 98% um, are not produced in Minnesota. So we just want to make sure folks understand that just because we have iron doesn't mean that folks are going to be coming by. We're, we're in a very competitive market, and this is the trend of iron ore prices. Um, the second slide is the trend in, in electric rates. And you can see that they go in significantly different directions. Um, you can see that there's been increases since 2008, and particularly big increases since 2012. Uh, in order to give you a little bit of a baseline, we produced this slide for you. Um, the red line is another U.S. Steel facility in a state with regulated electric rates. So that's the baseline that U.S. Steel uses to look at rates in Minnesota and other states compared to this baseline regulated rate. You can see around 2011, 2012, they were quite similar. Uh, and you can see the vast divergence that's happened now to the point that Minnesota power with uh, rates with the new uh, rate case they have is going to be 61% higher when in 2012 they were virtually the same. And then maybe the easiest um, way to describe this is you can see that we've got a slide here that shows many U.S. steel facilities across the country and their electric rates. And you can see, this was from 2015. This was actually used in testimony in 2015. And it shows where MinTech and KeyTech are compared to a whole bunch of U.S. steel facilities across the country. And then if you go to the last slide, you can see that we've moved from way to the left to way to the right. So that the only facility now that pays higher rates in the country for U.S. Steel is a facility that doesn't really use much, much energy. So we've had a lot of discussion about the importance of this, and there's been conversations we've heard about what's actually happening up there. I'll just tell you, this is, this is bills paid. This information is what we pay for our rates. We've seen some estimates from others that we're not quite sure what the basis of them were, but I can tell you that these are, these are actual rates by an actual facility. Um, it's, it's, it's an important issue. We've, I think Kelsey might have mentioned it, 20 to 30% of our costs of production, our energy, 
uh, we're very sensitive to energy costs, and we hope there'll be some cost containment as this bill moves through. We noticed that the inflation limitation that was in a previous amendment has been removed. Uh, we noticed that the cost-based rates requirements removed in place of a study. Um, and we hope we can talk with folks about that as this bill moves forward. Questions for members for this uh, testifier? Senator, Senator Senjin would like to start. Uh, Ms. Chair and Mr. Larson, is it reasonable for me to think, or anyone else, that this, these increases have been due to the advent of, uh, of renewable energy in the Minnesota power network? Mr. Larson? Um, Senator, Mr. Chair, Senator, um, we've, we've tried to leave that to Minnesota Power and, and talk about how these rates increased. Um, our point here is to show you the trend and to make the point that this trend, if continues, um, is quite a problem. So I'd, I'd defer to others to talk about why these increases occurred. Senator Simonson? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Larson. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. Um, clearly, <clears throat> utility costs continue to increase. Um, and uh, I, I certainly am not going to blame the utility. They're responding in part uh, to a lot of direction from the state legislature to the federal government, uh, things that they need to do to, to uh, operate their own business. But uh, just give us a sense in terms of uh, how much, a first question would be, how much uh, energy does uh, U.S. Steel use uh, in your two operations on the Iron Range? roughly, and two, about how many employees that you employ on the Iron Range? Um, Mr. We have, Mr. A three, Larson. we have a 300 megawatt load for, you, you would understand the comparison, it's equal to the city of Duluth absent the, the paper plant is roughly what the equivalent is. And you're going to stump me, I, th I think we're around 1,400 employees, I'll have to get back to you on that. Senator thank Simonson. You, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, I think one of the concerns that this committee has spent a lot of time on and haven't really quite landed on a definition yet is around affordability and reliability. Uh, and as I understand your operation, uh, both are critical to your operation going forward. Uh, Ms. Johnson referenced the fact that uh, iron ore produced on the iron range in Minnesota is about 2% of the global uh, supply, if you will. Um, at, and U.S. Steel is not headquartered in Minnesota, if I understand that correctly. Uh, but how, at what point in time do we run the risk of, of running U.S. Steel out of Minnesota? Mr. Larson? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator, um, you know, that's, that's an important issue. There's lots of things that affect iron ore and taconite in Minnesota. Uh, it's a global market, as is the steel market. Uh, most of those things you don't have control over in this, in this uh, room. Um, but one of the things you do have some control over is our energy rates, which are 25 or 30 percent of our costs. Um, you know, what iron ore prices are going to be and whether we have the ability to produce it at a cost that's competitive varies with a lot of factors. 20 or 30 percent of that is our electric rates. Senator Rosen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Larson, you, you mentioned that um, energy cost is 20 per, 25 percent of your annual cost. Is that correct? Mr. Chair, and Senator Mr. Rosen, Larson. that's correct. Senator Rosen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Has that percentage gone up since 2007? Mr. Larson. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Rosen, I'd have to get back to you on that. I, I, can, I can tell you, given the cost, the, 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 the um, percentage of cost, that's, that's power, energy in total, um, U.S. Steel doesn't miss a beat in trying to reduce oh, their sure. energy use. Yeah. I'd have to get back to you on how that has changed, though. Mr. Chair. Senator Rosen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Larson, I, I, I'm just trying to fight, figure out if that's been consistent all along through the entire lifespan of the industry, basically. <laughs> if it's uh, consistently high, and where is the variable in that 20 to, you know, 25 percent variable? Mr. Uh, Larson. Mr. Chair, Senator Rosen, um, it's been consistently high, and if you actually go back and read a little bit about the start of taconite production in Minnesota, the University of Minnesota said that it was actually the energy cost that caused them to really have a problem making taconite uh, viable, and it was the energy issues that they had to solve in order to actually make the taconite industry work in Minnesota. So it goes back to the 50s that this industry is worried about energy costs. Mm -hmm. Seeing no further questions for this testifier, well, Mr. Mr. Chair, Senator Rosen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Mr. Larson, it's not necessarily the renewables that have caused the, the increase in the 
energy cost. Then is that fair to say that? Mr. Rose, since uh, 2007. Uh, Mr. Larson. Mr. Chair, um, Senator Rosen, um, there have been a lot of environmental improvements at Minnesota Power that we've paid for, I think, north of $500 million, uh, in as an industry. And I'd really like to defer to Minnesota Power to answer that question, if you don't mind. Uh, no, that's fine. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, thank you, Mr. Larson. Uh, we've had two people that are either positive or neutral to this. Are there any individuals? I've stopped the clock. Uh, when we're asking questions. Are there any individuals that are against this amendment? So we can make sure we do have a uh, counterbalance and people who are against the item itself. Seeing none, are there any other individuals that wish to testify either way on this amendment? Seeing none. Uh, Annie, uh, yes. Feel free to step up. Sorry, I shouldn't refer to you by first name. Please, test, uh, please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and sorry I was difficult to spot back there. Um, I just I wanted to come up and thank Senator Senjum for bringing this amendment forward. Um, I know, Senator, you've been working really hard on um, this is a difficult issue to address um, in a way that helps all of the ratepayer class, including the large industrials and the residential customers and everyone else who's an electricity customer. Um, I'm sorry, I'm representing the Citizens Utility Board of Minnesota to um, advocate for residential and small business customers. We had serious concerns with the previous language that would have based rates um, on cost of service and the impact that that was likely to have to residential customers. Um, of course, the issues that Senator Simonson um, and the folks from the large industry are raising are, are really important and um, we want to be able to support um, electricity prices that keep our businesses healthy as well. Um, it gets really complicated in Minnesota power service territory just because it's such a unique utility where they have very, very few um, customers aside from maybe a dozen or so of the largest industries probably in the country. Um, and so solving those cost questions in that small service territory gets complicated. Um, so I think a study is a, a, a really good approach to it just so that we can understand all of the facts, um, where the utility is at, what factors are actually causing some of these um, changes and, and begin to take a more measured approach at how to act, really solve it. So thank you. Questions uh, to this testifier? Seeing none, thank you. Seeing no further, oh, please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Senator Osmek. Uh, Kevin Pranis uh, here on behalf of Lyuna, Minnesota, North Dakota. We represent uh, 12,000 construction, union construction laborers, and want to testify in favor of the amendment. Appreciate all the hard work uh, that uh, Senator Osmek and uh, Senator Senjim have put into coming up with a balanced clean energy proposal. Uh, our members are exposed on all sides. They're rate payers, uh, you know, including rate payers in Minnesota power territory. We also uh, depend very heavily on work in the mines and paper mills and the other, and so those industries are critically important to us, and we also work for Minnesota Power, and we believe that this study, I think, will help illuminate the challenges that are facing us up north, and we don't believe that those challenges can be solved simply through rate allocation. We think that the state needs to have a stronger policy to support mining in northern Minnesota and to support those industries while we continue to use more clean energy and to make sure that that creates local jobs, and we think the legislature Hopefully this study will produce recommendations the legislature can use to make sure that we're not, you know, taking it out either on ratepayers or on the mines that we need for jobs. Questions to the testifier from the members? Seeing none, thank you, sir, for your testimony. Members, to the 838 amendment, is there any further discussion? Senator Simonson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a comment. Um, Appreciate the folks that stepped up and testified. I appreciate Senator Senjum for bringing the amendment forward. Um, I, I think all of us up here would agree, uh, not that I pulled all of them, but I think that we all would agree that we don't want to raise rates on residential customers uh, or our industrial customers or anybody in between. Uh, ultimately, what we want is for Minnesota to move forward, uh, reduce its carbon emissions, uh, and at the same time maintain the high level of uh, industrial applications that we do enjoy here in Minnesota. So we've got to figure that out and we've got more work to do here, but uh, you know, this is a step in a direction. We'll see what they say when they come back, but I think just to be on the record that I, I can't imagine anybody here wants to raise rates on anybody. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the 838 amendment signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? 
Motion carries. Further amendments to the bill? Um, I see Mr. Bull back again. Do we want to take him before he, uh, we go any further with this, Senator Senjim, or what is Mr. your pleasure? Mr. Chair, he's, uh, he's my lifeline <laughs> on uh, nitty problems, so he's my consultant today. Well, Senator Senjim's lifeline has approached the, uh, approached the podium. Please state your name for the record. Begin your testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Mike Bull. I'm the uh, policy director for the Center for Energy and Environment. And actually, I don't have uh, much uh, to say other than to really appreciate the hard work that Senator Senjim and Senator and you, Mr. Chair, have put to, uh, uh, into this uh, proposal that's here today. It's a You've achieved somewhat of a rough balance, I think, amongst all the various interests, the labor folks, the clean energy folks, the utilities, uh, large power, as we've seen. It's a, uh, no, no one thinks this bill is perfect, but I think everyone is, uh, everyone has something uh, that they can like in the bill. And I think that's, a, that's due to the hard work of, of you two in particular. Thank you, Mr. Bull. Any questions for Mr. Bull? Seeing none, thank you for thank you for your testimony, Mr. Bull. Uh, we will move on to amendments then from members. Senator Barty. The A27 amendment. Senator Barty moves the A27 amendment. And Mr. Chair, while it's being distributed, Senator Marty. I'll just explain. It's just uh, deleting a couple words, and that is that the preference for carbon-free resources in the bill on page seven, bottom of page seven, top of page eight have that preference only for um, in Minnesota. And I would argue that much of our power is purchased from outside the state and we should be including um, non-Minnesota cases as well. <coughs> Otherwise, I mean, if we don't do that, we have some of the like GRE, a lot of the co-op muni folks are going to be, I think in some of the coal contracts they're getting in other states are um, 20, 30 years out. In a this, this committee will be in recess. of the Senate, whether you are in favor of, a, of an amendment or a favor of a bill, we do not have public displays within the uh, hearing room. I think we all understand that. Uh, that is why I recessed. Senator Marty. Uh, Mr. Chair, so the amendment would simply have us um, put the preference, I mean, if we want clean energy first, we should want clean energy first for wherever it's coming from. And I'm, I am concerned that 10, 20 years from now, a lot of the co-op and muni customers are going to be facing very high utility rate increases as, as they're tied into these long-term coal contracts. And I think we should be putting the preference should be across the board, not just for facilities in Minnesota, but wherever the facilities are. I urge your support and ask for a roll call. Roll call requested. Roll call is granted. Senator Senjim. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, I would... I've thought a lot about this. I would oppose it. I, I just simply would like this bill, at least initially, and by the way, this is a journey. Uh, you know, what we decided in 2020 is uh, maybe different than Wilda decided in 2025, but uh, for the here and now and for day, uh, I would like this bill to be limited to Minnesota. Thank you, Senator Senjum. Any further discussion to the A27 amendment? Senator Simonson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you, Senator Marty. I appreciate what you're saying, but I, but I do think that the underlying bill, uh, as represented by the A-17, uh, represents a lot of work, a lot of discussion, a lot of movement towards the center uh, for a lot of folks, and, and I don't know that there's anybody out there that actually really loves the bill, uh, but hopefully uh, not everybody exactly hates the bill, but I think that this is an important provision, and I would support Senator Senjum. Further discussion to the amendment? Seeing none, seeing none, the clerk will take the roll on the A27 amendment. 
Chair Osmond? No. Senator Dibble? Yes. Senator Hoffman? Senator Marty? Yes. Senator Matthews? No. Senator Pratt? No. Senator Rarick? No. Senator Rosen? No. Senator Sanjem? No. Senator Simonson? No. On a vote of six to two, the amendment is not adopted. Further amendments, members? Seven to two. Oh. Seven to two. Six to two. Seven. Sorry, seven to two. You need to take off your shoes to count, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> seven to two, with one not present. Further amendments? Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I have a question that may result in an amendment, depending on the answer to the question. If that's all right. Senator Dibble, question away. Uh, so, Senator Senjum, um, I'm looking at lines 3.9 to 3.12 of the A17. Uh, this is paragraph 3 on the uh, uh, demand side management program for, for large industrials. Um, and it, uh, it actually kind of um, pairs with paragraph 2, which allows for fair compensation to the eligible customers um, and then allows the IOU to recover uh, the cost of that compensation, um, however, uh, not from uh, the, the, the customer who's participating in the, in the DSM program. So I, I'm wondering what, um, I mean, I want to be clear, I very much support demand side management programs. I think it's a good idea, especially for these intensive users. I um, think it allows us to avoid building new generation, possibly saving everyone uh, dollars. Um, so I support that. Um, but uh, I want to understand the, the recovery piece, especially when um, the, those who are participating are, are exempted uh, from participating in, in some of that um, uh, uh, repayment. It, I know it seems to make sense because, of course, they're benefiting and they're being compensated, so why should they part with any of their dollars? But I just wonder the implications for shifting um, and if we're not um, allow, essentially allowing them to benefit twice. We're, we're compensating them for um, their participation in demand side management. They're also benefiting from not having to support a uh, new generation, so they're kind of benefiting a couple times over. And um, I'm worried about that. Can you help me understand paragraph three? Uh, Senator Dibble, just so I understand, which lines were you looking at? 3.9 to 3.12. 3.9 to 3.12. Yeah, which, Senator, which supports paragraph two, 3.3 to 3.8. Right. Senator Senjum. Thank you, Senator Dibble. I'm still not sure I'm grasping your, your question. We, I think we all probably both know what demand side management means here. Uh, can you, can you just help me a little bit further? Are you, are well, you worried about sure. some sort of a double dipping effect? Senator, uh, Senator Dibble? Yeah, double dipping and cost shifting to other classes of customers. Senator Sengen? Senator Dibble, I'm obviously not an expert in this. Maybe there's some in the audience. Uh, uh, I'd, I, I would say that if there's double dipping, I think, you know, if you, if you weigh that against what you do, just talked about in terms of uh, the need to build additional facilities and so on, uh, that that the double dipping would perhaps be the preference because it is so occasional. It's, it's this doesn't happen often, uh, in my view, at least it didn't where I worked. Uh, and uh, I'm just believing that given the choices, this is a better approach than. Uh, and maybe if you have to accept a little double dipping, if that frankly occurs, that's probably the price of, of a good demand side management program. I, I can add, I'd say any more than that, and maybe there's, again, more expertise in this room. Senator Dibble, we have someone to the podium that may answer that question. Please state your name for the record, and please respond to the inquiry on page 3, nine, lines 9 through 12. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Dibble, Andrew Maratska, law firm Stoll Reeves. Uh, um, I do a fair amount of work on behalf of large industrial customers before the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission, so uh, I think I generally understand Senator Dibble's question, and the, the way I would describe the 
um, demand side management is that you are getting a lesser quality of service. In other words, you have um, under the utilities tariffs and under the laws in the state of Minnesota, the right to respect, uh, expect um, not perfect service, but very good and reliable service. If you are signing up for a program where you are going to have your service interrupted, uh, be that a residential customer or a commercial customer or a large industrial customer, you are getting a less, you, you are signing up for a lesser quality of service. It will be less reliable because it will be interrupted and you will be, and, and in exchange for that interruption, you will uh, receive a credit. So if you also have that credit um, for the lesser quality of service watered down by paying for that credit, um, you aren't receiving the full value of signing up for that lesser quality of service. So all this provision does, is, as I understand it, is simply say you shouldn't um, pay twice for that lesser quality of service. Senator Dribble? So um, thank you. I'm not disputing that um, uh, eligible customers um, shouldn't receive consideration for participating in demand side management programs. My question is, um, you know, what will the level of compensation be? And, um, and um, you know, given that they're also going to benefit from that utilities um, need to not necessarily build new generation. So they're already getting a benefit there from participating in terms of, you know, controlling increasing rates. That's the whole principle around conservation and efficiency um, improvements um, or part, part of the rationale for, for SIP and, and those sorts of programs. Um, but it says that uh, the investor owned electric utility can recover the compensation from all the other uh, rate payers. Uh, and except for those who are participating in the DSM program. So I'm just concerned about um, a double benefit and a, and a cost shift. So Mr. Sullivan is well, at the Senator uh, Dibble, let me take a quick sw swing at it before mm -hmm. that we get there. So I think what we, an example of this that we could talk about is the when the polar vortex hit us last year, uh, that these these, in, these industrials would be part already, you know, of the demand side management. But when they are called upon to shut down, there are hard costs that are still going to be at, going to be taking place. While you say that they are going to be getting a benefit, you're right. But they also have, when this happens, additional costs that are incurred by that utility, such as they still have to pay the salaries of the individuals, even though they can't produce anything. They have no product, but they have hard costs that are still going to be taking place. I think that might be the general gist of the direction we're going with this. Uh, but I'll let Mr. Sullivan and perhaps the others uh, speak more cl more clearly to it if I haven't muddied it all up. Senator, uh, Mr. Sullivan, please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Senator Osmick, uh, Senator Dibble, members of the committee, my name is Joe Sullivan. I'm the Deputy Commissioner for the Division of Energy Resources at the Department of Commerce. Um, can you hear me there? Um, so um, I've got a little bit of a sore throat today, so sorry. Um, in general, you know, we've, we've reviewed the language, uh, the demand response program, the, the demand side management language, and I, I guess our, our first thoughts are that the way that it is structured, we don't think is optimal. Um, you know, I, the having non-participating participating members footing the entire costs, we don't think is a way that is going to encourage a successful program. Now, if you think about something like Excel's Saver Switch, uh, Excel Saver Switch, there's a benefit that goes to all. Um, everybody who's involved in the saver switch, but everybody through their rates pays for the saver switch. It's a resource for the system, so we think that those resources for the system should be paid by all rate payers. But there is an, an, an especially with some of the large users, there's an undeniable benefit. Um, they have such large load uh, that, you know, we could see a, 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 a demand side management or I, I think a, a more properly put, a demand response program working uh, very effectively for them. 
And in fact, Minnesota Power does have a, a, a DR program for those large users already. Um, what I will say is that the, that the department um, would be committed to working with the committee, with Senator Sengem, with large users, uh, to structure this in a way that we think is, is, would be better, uh, would be uh, a more optimal, uh, and lead to uh, what we think of as a successful uh, DR program or DSM program. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. Any further discussion, Senator Marty? Mr. Chair, um, I think I'm hearing from Mr. Sullivan the same sort of thing I'm hearing from Senator Dibble, and that is that the point of the demand side management, is if it's going to save Minnesota Power or whomever X amount of money by having this demand side management program in place, overall it's going to be good for all the customers, including the participant in the demand side management program. That's why paragraph two fairly compensates them. And then you're saying for, for the fact that everybody's going to have lower rates because of the demand side management program, but um, there's this cost to do that, which is, say, it's three quarters of the savings. Um, we're going to say that the one customer is not going to have to pay their share of the cost. So I think it is a double dipping, whether it's whether Senator Dibble wants to try and fix it here or Mr. Sullivan work with people. It is a problem because there is a double dip there. Well, Senator Marty, just somewhat in response on this, this is still been going to be governed by the PUC. What it does say is that it allows the the I, the industry investor owned utility to go to the PUC to present to them costs. It doesn't necessarily say that the PUC can or will. Uh, provide any additional funding, but if there are associated costs, I think that the direction of this particular section uh, is simply to allow a mechanism where when it does occur that these utilities can go in and say, listen, this here are the impacts, and the PUC gets to make a judgment on are these reasonable or unreasonable for, for a recovery. Senator Marty. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I, I agree with you that the PUC is the one that makes the decision, but what it says at the bottom of page two, it says they can approve, disapprove, or modify it, but the conditions of what they do shall, must is the term they use at the bottom last for the page, fairly compensate the eligible customer. They determine what fair compensation is, but they have to fairly compensate them. And then number two in paragraph three, it says that the utility shall not recover any of the costs of compensation from the demand response customer. So you are forcing their hand. They're the ones who make the decision. But if they approve the program, they have to give fair compensation under two, and they have to make sure everybody else pays for it under three. They don't have a choice there. And fair, that's a fair statement. Also, you, they have to go fairly compensate, which means they have to evaluate what's presented in front of them to determine that. So. I think we're sort of both coming at it from a little bit of a different angle. Senator Dibble? Um, so, so Mr. Chair, I, I, I will not offer an amendment at this moment, um, but um, I, I might, uh, because I am concerned about this language starting at line 3.10 through 3.12, which says provided, however, that the utility shall not recover any cost of compensation or other costs associated with the demand side management program from any demand response customer facility. Um, you know, for the reasons that Mr. Sullivan cited and my concerns that, you know, that Senator Marty also articulated, which is that uh, everyone's benefiting from the demand side management program and granted uh, um, there should be fair compensation uh, to those uh, industrial customers that are uh, going to some expense resulting from the interruption in their business processes. Um, but, you know, they should participate even a little bit, you know, uh, in, in what is essentially obtaining a, a resource. I mean, we try to think of conservation and efficiency and demand side management is thought of as a, as a mechanism for conservation and greater efficiency in our energy system at, at peak moments and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, I think we're trying to think of that more traditionally as a resource. Um, and, and all ratepayers help obtain the resources, the generation sources, um, the other mechanisms we have to meet the energy needs of the entire service area. 
And Senator Dibble, you have a second bite at the apple next week if you decide to present that. So I appreciate you not presenting it now. I think there still is obviously going to be seven days worth of uh, additional discussion uh, that we may have on this. So, members, further amendments? Senator Marty. Mr. Chair, I have the A26 amendment. Senator Marty moves the A26 amendment while it's being passed out. Senator Marty. Sure, Mr. Chair, this amends the preference for um, carbon-free resources. Um, at the top of page 9, it says it does not apply to facilities previously approved or approved by the legislature or, in other words, the, pro the things that are already in effect, we're not going to count them in the preference. And also would take um, clause... F, I believe it is, um, on page line nine, page nine, line 17 through 19, about the decision to continue operating a peaking generation facility, um, that those things would be exempted from it as well. In other words, if the goal should be clean energy first, not clean energy some of the time, but we should be counting all the factors. And like with the one for counting outside of Minnesota ones, I think this is the same issue. We're trying to say we want clean energy first, but we're going to exempt uh, most of the decisions we're making. So I, I'm troubled by that, and I urge you to delete um, those two clauses and um, ask for roll call. Roll call requested. Roll call granted. Senator Senjum. Mr. Chair, my understanding is this, uh, this would uh, be a retroactive age, uh, action uh, on, uh, re relative to the... Uh, to the Becker situation and Entech, I believe, in Superior, Wisconsin. Uh, uh, these have already been approved by, you know, the commission. Uh, I would not be in favor of, of, uh, of, of any retroactivity here with respect to those issues. Thank you, Senator Senjum. I think also on lines 9, 17 through 19, that'll, for all realistic purposes, it probably completely eliminates any peaker uh, plants that may be needed uh, on the grid to maintain reliability and affordability, which is exactly, well, for certainly reliability, um, and that is one of the key hallmarks of this bill, is focusing on to make sure that we have reliable energy in the state of Minnesota. Taking that out would essentially leave us hot in the, hot in the summer and cold in the winter, at least it's my opinion. Senator Marty. Mr. Chair, just to point out at the, the preference that we're talking about here at the bottom of page 7, it says that this, they shall not approve the carbon emitting resource in a plan or certificate of need unless the utility demonstrates that the carbon free resource alone or in combination is not in the public interest. So you already have those factors being considered there. In other words, we're saying we want you to consider this if it's in the public interest but then even if it is in the public interest, we're not going to allow you to count these, these two categories. And I think just like the non-Minnesota things, we ought to be counting all of them because they still have that determination. Is it in the public interest or not? Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you. Just to, to um, expand a tiny bit on Senator Marty's points, um, uh, those, these two provisions create uh, an exemption and an exception for uh, fossil fuel sources of generation, um, which kind of runs counter to what is the stated underlying intent of this whole bill. And, um, um, and, and as I understand, uh, in at least a couple of instances, these actually aren't, this isn't retroactive. These are facilities that are kind of in the in process of, of being considered. They've been proposed and they've made a part way down the path, but they're not they're not a done deal. And so it makes sense to consider the most cost effective and environmentally effective aspects of the entire portfolio that's being proposed in these IRPs. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I will speak up and go on record on this. I am not just a no on this amendment. I am a heck no. I'll keep this PG for all the kids that are in our, our television audience. Um, and it's because of it's, it's specifically targeting uh, my community that's already taken a gigantic step with the decommissioning of, of uh, Sherco 1 and Sherco 2, a gas plant that's been approved and has not yet uh, begun construction. I'm going to stand uh, firmly against those that are trying to 
reach back and claw that back. Uh, our community has, um, has taken on a lot to get to this point and I'm not going to um, let the rug get pulled out from under them after the concessions they've already made on this. So I will uh, be strongly opposing this amendment. Senator Matthews, congratulations on the first part of fatherhood, which is governing your, your words that come out of your mouth because you're gonna learn in 18 years what happens when you don't. Talk to my kids. Further discussion? Seeing none, the clerk will take roll on the A26 amendment. Chair Osmick? No. Senator Dibble? Yes. Senator Hoffman? Senator Marty? Yes. Senator Matthews? Heck no. <laughs> Senator Pratt? No. Senator Rarick? No. Senator Rosen? No. Senator Senjem? No. Senator Simonson? No. On a vote of seven to two, the amendment is not adopted. For their amendments, Senator, uh, what was the vote? Seven to two. Okay. Further amendments to the bill. Senator Dibble. Talking too fast today. You can call me anything you want. Just don't call <laughs> me late to dinner. Um, Be careful what you so, ask for. Uh, I'll, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair, I'll offer the A28 amendment, please. Senator Dibble moves the A28 amendment. As the amendment is being passed out, Senator Dibble to the A28 amendment. Uh, so, Mr. Chair, this would uh, um, eliminate uh, the um, inclusion of uh, refuse-derived fuel as a carbon-free and renewable source of energy for the purpose of in counting it uh, in the uh, IRP process. Um, I understand that we already have it classified over on the renewable energy side as such, um, but it's really not, and so I don't think we should... Uh, exacerbate a mistake um, that has been that has been made already in in uh, statute and policy I have a handout it's somewhere in my piles here um, the, the simple fact of the matter is is that uh, um, here we are the simple fact of the matter is and I'll, I'll just keep this quick because I, as I promised to you I don't intend to uh, spend too much time on on a series of amendments that uh, Senator Marty and I have. We just would like to bring these issues up for discussion um, uh, and, uh, and make our points. Um, but, uh, and I have a handout here for the pages if they could come grab that. Um, uh, the short version is, you know, uh, refuse derived fuel, I think, uh, leads us down the path um, uh, negatively on a couple of different important policies and considerations for Minnesotans. One is that um, it, it uh, definitely cuts against um, our ability to uh, uh, more aggressively pursue uh, waste reduction initiatives, uh, whether that's through uh, product uh, stewardship ideas or um, you know working uh, hard to uh, recycle um, and and to um, change the nature of our packaging and other things uh, to to be uh, more recyclable and or compostable. And uh, refuse derived fuel, when incinerated, um, isn't clean. Um, has a high carbon profile. Has a, a toxins profile. Um, it generates ash um, that is sometimes used for other products that, or, or um, other kinds of uh, activities that aren't safe. The residue itself um, is disposed in landfills, um, so it doesn't like vanish into thin air. Um, uh, you know, there is some some leftover, and um, that. This is a different handout. Yeah. So, yeah, this is, well, well this is a, another handout that I want for a future pol um, amendment. So I guess pages got a little ahead of themselves. That's fine. Um, uh, so um, I would like to request a roll call vote. Roll call requested. Roll call is granted. Senator Senjim. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, this is perhaps a my heck no. <laughs> and, uh, only because, uh, you know, we're all to some extent, uh, victims of where we came from. Uh, our Olmsted County Waste Energy Facility was described in Rochester as a gem. It is a gem. Uh, it heats and cools, uh, I believe, 42 fairly major downtown buildings. It spins electricity. It uh, takes care of the 
terrible problem of, of citing landfills and everything associated with landfills from a pollution point of view. Uh, coincidentally, as chair of the bonding committee, we're looking at a, a landfill in Burnsville, Minnesota that uh, is well going to perhaps cost the state of Minnesota over, Minnesota over $100 million to dig up, to reline, and to, uh, at least per recommendation of the Pollution Control Agency, actually put the waste back in. Uh, I, I think going forward, we're going to need to burn more of this. Uh, we, we cannot afford to bury this stuff. We've got to find some sort of a beneficial use. And yes, we recycle and we compost and do all of those things. But there's always this leftover waste that uh, I believe incineration and energy production is its best use for. So I would oppose the amendment. Thank you, Senator Senjum. Uh, I saw a little scurrying back there. Is there a testifier that would like to speak for or against this amendment? Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, yes, my name is Tony Hainault. I work for Hennepin County Public Works. I'd like to speak against the amendment. Uh, drawdown is a list of uh, 80 critical steps we can take to reverse global warming. It's compiled by Paul Hawken and includes waste energy as a transition technology. His advisors on the project include notable climate change experts, Elizabeth Colbert, Bill McKibben, Barry Lopez, Annie Leonard, the executive director of Greenpeace. The report does not so much embrace waste energy uh, as it recognizes its potential as a bridge solution and identifies that 1.1 gigatons of carbon dioxide emissions can be avoided by 2050 through waste energy, primarily from reducing methane emissions um, by keeping them out of, um, uh, keeping the waste out of landfills. Hennepin County supports zero waste, but in the short term, we still have 700,000 tons of waste to manage. That's after we recycle half of the waste generated in the county. Um, since 2007, average waste generation per capita in Hennepin County has been has reduced by, um, decreased by 20%. Over time, per capita waste generation nationally has decreased uh, by 4%. We're proud of that. Uh, the trash we produce, um, if not managed at HERC, um, would end up in a landfill. There are two landfills uh, remaining in the seven county metro area, Burnsville Sanitary and Pine Bend. They're both approaching a permit capacity. They're both ex um, uh, seeking expansion of that capacity. Metro waste also flows to the Elk River landfill, the Sherman County in Sherman County, uh, Spruce Ridge landfill in McLeod County, the Central Disposal landfill in Lake Mills, Iowa, and two facilities uh, in Wisconsin and Serona uh, and in Eau Claire. But today there are 175 garbage trucks that will come into our Hennepin Energy Recovery Center in downtown Minneapolis in the North Loop, where we manage the waste in the most environmentally and fiscally responsible way possible. That's 1,000 tons a day that needs to go someplace. It's only 350,000 tons a year, so that's an additional 350,000 tons a year from Hennepin County that goes to landfill even after we have reduced, reused, and recycled 700,000 tons. We all need to consider the environmental impacts associated with landfilling waste. Trucking that waste up 94 or down 35W is not good either. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you, sir. Can you sign the uh, sheet of paper there so we've got your name for the record? Further discussion? Senator Rosen was first on my list. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I, I, I'm glad Senator Sengem is opposing the amendment. I do think, uh, Senator Dibble, that perhaps we need to take a different look at this and, and not that it is competing with waste reduction or waste recycling. They should be succinct together. It's not a competitive uh, behavior that we're asking for here. It is it's something that they should be working along alongside each other. And the mere fact that we are closing our power plants, there is a, frankly, a concern that there isn't going to be the fly ash available to for concrete. 
production and all the other things that fly ash is involved in. I was just visiting a, um, a culvert uh, production site in my district by Cambria, and, and um, they are concerned about fly ash and if it's going to be available in the future for, for production of concrete. So I would like to change the trajectory and the train of thought um, as not being a competitive spirit. It's we are in it together. Let's work towards recycling, uh, lower waste consumption while still doing the appropriate thing with the waste. Response, Senator Dibble. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I just want to remind everyone that uh, that we're putting refuse-derived fuel, we're, we're classifying it as uh, a renewable source of energy, um, you know, implying that uh, somehow it's, it's on par with um, solar, wind, um, hydro, um, even even nuclear, and and it's it's not. Um, uh, it has a, a pretty uh, significant pollution profile. Um, whether that's from the trucks um, hauling, you know, I'm just looking at my little handout here. Um, you know, the trucks that are that are hauling the waste to the facilities, the emissions. You know, the ash is not benign, and and the uh, the residue of the final product is is not benign. Uh, either. Um, these facilities, you know, aren't located in the center of the Tony parts of my district, um, Lowry Hill, Kenwood, East Isles, they're located adjacent to, and if you see where the plume goes, um, it goes to the low income, towards the low income areas of, of our city. Um, so it has disparate impacts and, you know, not insignificant uh, health implications. And um, I'll just remind everyone that we have a, a solid waste tax that we all pay, um, and that was originally created. It's called the score to create the score fund, um, which is supposed to then be used for grants uh, to municipalities and counties for the purpose of boosting their, uh, you know, cleaning up their solid waste disposal system um, through a variety of different ways, and we divert. Uh, I think up to half of those dollars into the general fund. So um, if we are committed to uh, doing something different with our solid waste from beginning to end, whether it's going all the way back to our manufacturers and working with them and how they produce products and then how they manage the end use of those products um, or customers or municipalities and counties that are responsible for the disposal uh, portion, um, Let's stop diverting those score funds into the general fund and, and let's get serious and really energize some of those initiatives. Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I wanted to comment. I, I support the amendment. I, I think Mr. Hainolt is right that when he said that it's being seen as a transition fuel because I think we are going to be using it as a transition right now. Um, but that doesn't make it clean. I mean, it's anything but clean energy and um, and the idea that, well, yeah, we got this problem because we got all these trucks of garbage going all over the place um, and we got landfill shortage. That's why we should be addressing the waste stream and cleaning it up rather than continually trying to, I mean, you can't call this clean energy. It's not. You can call it less dirty than some of the other things perhaps, but you can't call it clean energy. Um, I think that we, we should be recognizing it's going to be used in the short term as a, I think Mr. Haino called it a transition fuel or a bridge or transition fuel. I think it is going to be used that way, but that doesn't mean it's ideal or that we should be giving it the same credit as other clean and renewable sources of energy. I just think it's a different thing. It's, it shouldn't be labeled the same. It should not be treated the same in our hierarchy. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take a roll. I'm sorry. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. No problem. Hi, my name is Jessica Trich. Uh, I work with the Sierra Clubs uh, Beyond Coal to Clean Energy campaign. Can you bring the microphone you. to, oh, okay. there you go. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right, thank you, Chair Osmek, uh, and thank you, Senator Dibble, committee members. Uh, thank you for this amendment. Uh, I am here to speak in support of it. Um, I will be brief and just echo some of the points that other folks have brought up. Um, we are very concerned with the idea of adding uh, waste incineration into uh, classifying it as renewable energy in this uh, proposal. Um, as has been mentioned, uh, we, 
waste incineration is not clean. There are a lot of emissions that come from that. And unfortunately, those emissions disproportionately impact low-income communities and communities of color here in Minnesota and across the country. Uh, across the U.S., eight out of 10 waste incinerators are located in low-income communities or communities of color. Um, and most of these incinerators across the country are located in places where incinerators are considered renewable energy. Um, so we're concerned with incentivizing more waste incineration by considering this and prioritizing this as clean energy uh, instead of uh, what we believe is clean energy of uh, wind energy, solar, energy storage, energy conservation. Um, and instead, uh, as others have indicated, it is important to focus on the waste stream uh, itself and look towards <coughs> minimizing that as opposed to incentivizing um, uh, waste incineration as clean energy. So that is all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Senator Dibble, the only thing, I, only thing I would respond to you on this is that the section on line 5.4 4 says renewable energy means, and it, then it goes into that. So I don't think I ever used the word that it's clean, um, but it's certainly, I, in my opinion, would be considered renewable. So um, I, I just don't want to necessarily say it's clean because I agree with you, it belches pollution, no doubt about it, just as the biomass facility in Benson did, no doubt about it. Senator Sencham. Mr. Chair, I just want to go back, maybe more for the, for the audience outside of here. Uh, again, in Rochester, you know, this is a balance. And uh, uh, yes, waste is burned. Yes, that waste produces some carbon dioxide, at least in our city. Uh, but that same waste and that same energy is derived from that, that steam that's created uh, does heat and cool. 44 buildings, all of which would have to have their own individual boiler systems uh, spewing forth this same CO2. So, so life is a balance, plus we get the electricity off that that uh, is almost virtually, except for the capital cost, free. And so there's, there's a lot of virtue to these district energy systems, and, and waste is a good fuel for those systems, in my view. And so, uh, yes, it may not uh, be one of those perfect terms, but I think it fits admirably into this, uh, this so-called clean energy and, and energy transition bill that we're trying to put forward here. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the A28 amendment. Chair Osmick? No. Senator Dibble? Yes. Senator Hoffman? Senator Marty? Yes. Senator Matthews? No. Senator Pratt? No. Senator Rarick? No. Senator Rosen? No. Senator Sanjum? No. Senator Simonson? On a vote of seven to two, the amendment is not adopted. Further amendments, Jim members? We do have about 10 minutes remaining in our time frame. And we will be picking this up again on Thursday. Senator Barty, you raised your pen. Um, Mr. Chair, I have the A40 amendment. Senator Barty moves the A40 amendment. The amendment will be distributed. While that's being distributed, Senator Marty. Mr. Chair, I hope this is not a controversial one with Senator Senjum or others, but this is simply in the coordinated energy transition study um, to look at the costs and benefits. Um, right now it's talking simply about the costs of operational changes and building up the grid. Um, there are clearly benefits of doing so as well, and um, I do have concerns at several places in here. We, we're going to study this, but we're going to tilt the playing field in certain ways. I think asking for a look at costs and benefits is a simple fairness issue. Senator Senjan. Mr. Chair and members, I, uh, I adore this amendment. <laughs> <laughs> Members, to the amendment, all those in favor of the A40 amendment signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. I love it when a plan comes together. Senator Dibble. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to offer the A35 amendment, please. Senator Dibble moves the A35 amendment. The amendment will be distributed. Senator Dibble. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Chair, this provides for, um, or it, um, says that uh, the 
uh, carbon dioxide that would be captured from uh, carbon sequestration and capture technology um, would uh, not be used for the purposes of fracking, for you know, basically pulling oil and natural gas out of the ground that would then emit more carbon. So it'd be, you know, it's kind of doesn't make sense um, that that the underlying goal and intent of this bill is to reduce carbon out of the uh, at least the energy uh, utility electricity sector, but then we would utilize the carbon captured to pull fossil fuels out of the ground um, to then burn and create um, more carbon emitted into the atmosphere. And so this, while it doesn't touch the language that allows the uh, commercial use of carbon dioxide captured and transferring to a third party for commercial use, it does say that it can't be used for fracking um, for, for that purpose. So. Senator Senjum. I would like to request a roll call. Roll call requested. Roll call granted. Senator Senjum. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Uh, I would oppose this amendment. Uh, from all that I have learned uh, about carbon sequestration, uh, and I've had visited a plant in Canada, uh, but above and beyond that, the people that uh, I've talked to relative, and I would describe them as uh, energy environmental experts, have suggested to me at least that. Uh, we may need carbon capture to be that bridge going forward as uh, we advance clean energy in, in Minnesota. And, and to that extent, uh, uh, at least what I was told in Canada was that uh, uh, the, this is not feasible financially except for, if you will, enhanced oil recovery and carbon capture, then of course, so I, or carbon sequestration. Uh, so I would oppose the amendment. Uh, I think uh, we've worked a lot on this to try to find, if you will, the right balance. And uh, I would suggest we just leave it as it is. Senator Dibble, I, I, I am also opposed. And I want to sort of talk through what this is. So for the life of me, I don't understand why environmental concerns wouldn't be supportive of carbon sequestration for this reason. Uh, we're going to. For the foreseeable future, whether we like it or not, we are not going to have electric cars in Minnesota everywhere. We're going to need oil, not only for transportation services, uh, uh, but also just for industry, for what we create. Uh, plastic comes to mind. And if we're going to need a barrel of oil, that is a fact. Your choices are the following. You can use carbon sequestration and use carbon dioxide to pump into existing wells and get the oil. Or, behind door number two, you can build a explore for the oil, spend all the carbon exploring for a new well, build roads and infrastructure to get to the new well, dig the new well, create rail lines or mechanisms to get the oil to market from the new well, and expend all the carbon that's necessary to get that same barrel of oil from a new source. Or, as I said, you can simply use carbon dioxide to create that barrel without all of that carbon being expanded in the atmosphere. And there's one additional benefit of actually putting the carbon in. It goes back into the ground. Granted, some may come back with the oil when it comes up in the extraction process, fair enough. But it is scientifically provable and without a doubt uh, without a doubt, scientifically possible that that carbon goes back in the, into the ground. No doubt whatsoever. So if we're going to not expend all this carbon to get that barrel of oil, and then on top of it actually put carbon back into the ground, extracting it from the atmosphere, even if it's just a portion of it, for the life of me, I don't understand why this isn't a good thing for our atmosphere. Senator Dibble. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my proposal doesn't prevent any of that. It simply says that when we're defining a carbon-free resource, we're not uh, calling a carbon-free resource for the purpose of creating an advantage to, uh, to utilities um, uh, and, uh, frankly, a, 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 dire a policy direction that uh, we're saying that they should use uh, carbon captured um, to inject into the ground um, for the purpose of extracting oil and natural gas. Um, you know, just like with the refuse-derived fuel, 
uh, conversation. Nothing in that amendment prevented our ability to continue to pursue waste to energy programs and policies and build facilities. It just said we're not going to count that as some sort of an advantaged carbon-free um, uh, fuel resource. Um, and, you know, this bill is being um, advertised as, you know, clean energy first. Um, and I even heard on the radio this morning, um, you know, a tip of the hat to this great uh, bipartisan uh, compromise to, uh, to really put at the center of the debate and the discussion, you know, bipartisanly and, and across chambers, clean energy first. And I'm just trying to make that more true than is true today in the language of the A-17. Senator Simonson, would you like to rename the bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually should probably write that amendment, uh, <clears throat> but I don't want to do it on the fly. Okay. Uh, Senator Simonson. Uh, Senator Dibble, uh, I've always thought of this uh, particular version that we're kind of working through now as, as more of a carbon emission reduction strategy, but that doesn't sound quite as flashy uh, as clean energy first, but I, I think we've evolved from the original uh, clean energy first that Senator Senjum uh, introduced uh, 2018, I think that was maybe. Um, but I think part of me feels like, and I know you wouldn't do this because I know you, uh, part of me feels like this is like a gotcha vote, and, and I don't want to presume that it is. Uh, clearly, we've all seen the television shows where fracking leads to flaming balls of fire coming out of people's kitchen faucets and things like that, and nobody here wants to see that. Uh, but at the same time, we have a serious problem facing us. And you know, we've not necessarily debated whether climate change is real or not, but I think that we all can agree that we're moving forward in a direction that's trying to reduce carbon emissions into the atmosphere. And that's going to require an all-of-the-above strategy, and that's what, essentially what this is. None of this is perfect. Uh, none of it is, is the best answer. Nobody up here has the absolute best answer. This is what we should do to re reduce emissions 100% by such and such a date. That does not exist today. The technology does not exist for this state of Minnesota to operate on 100% renewables. Might we have that technology in five years? Maybe. Ten years? Maybe. I don't know what that number is. But we need some kind of transformation to get us from point A to point B. And I think to, to say that we can't use um, diverted CO2 for hydraulic fracturing limits opportunities. We're going to need gas to help us through this transition. There is no way to get around that. And by doing uh, what, your, what your amendment does, it, it just takes one of those options out of the, off the table, and it takes one of those tools out of the toolbox. And I would just encourage people to look at this as, as truly an all-of-the-above strategy to try to help reduce carbon emissions. Nobody's up here advocating for uh, additional emissions to be emitted into the atmosphere. That is not the point. The point is that we need an all-of-the-above strategy, and we, we've got to get behind some of these things. So I, I certainly oppose this amendment, uh, and I can already see the emails, but I, I think that all we're doing is taking away options for uh, utilities to help us get from point A to point B. Further discussion to the amendment? Seeing none, um, sorry, S grab a microphone. Please state your name for the record. Begin your testimony. Thank you, Just Chair Osmeg and members of the committee and Senator Dibble. My name is Sarah Wolf. I'm with the Minnesota Environmental Partnership. And I just wanted to speak to, um, speak to that concept that we're talking about with the carbon sequestration. And while it may be good to put it back down in the ground, the, um, the unintended ex uh, effects of that coming back out and the energy intensiveness of this kind of technology that will require more energy to be expended doing that. Um, but mostly I wanted to speak to the idea that it would be um, putting further investments into this, which is not a carbon-free resource. So it's really kind of um, just pointing the direction in a way that doesn't get us to the ultimate goal, which will need to be that total reduction. So we think it's far better to build the framework and a foundation that gets us to the goal we need. Thank you. Please make sure you sign the uh, sign-in paper there. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the A35 amendment. Senator Osmick? No. Senator Dibble? 
Senator Hoffman? Senator Marty? Yes. Senator Matthews? No. Senator Pratt? No. Senator Rarick? No. Senator Rosen? No. Senator Senjum? No. Senator Simonson? No. On a vote of seven to two, the amendment is not adopted. Members, we probably have time for one more amendment. If it's non-controversial like the A40, it'd be really good. And on a high note. Senator Simonson. Mr. Chair, I, I'm not gonna offer an amendment right now because I don't wanna be rushed. Uh, but I do wanna just say, <clears throat> as we come back to this next Thursday, uh, there's a couple of things that I wanna address uh, and I just wanna put it on the record if I can. Uh, first thing, uh, Senator Senjum, I'm, I'm sure you saw the two letters in our packet, uh, one from the carpenters uh, and one from the uh, operating engineers. There's some real concerns in there from, uh, from organized labor about a couple of different pieces. So I've, I've, I'm telling you that I'm going to reach out to them and see if we can come up with a solution that addresses some of their concerns. That's point one. Uh, point two is that I'll want to have a conversation next Thursday about uh, how we retire some of these uh, fossil fuel assets, if you will, uh, at least in the short term, uh, as they're working through their uh, projected end of life. But uh, in the absence of time, I'll hold that till Thursday. So members, if there's any additional wrap up, I think this is a good time to do it. It is after 2.30. Um, seeing none, any wrap up for today, Senator Senjum? Uh, thank you, members. Uh, I appreciate the conversation today and the discussion. Uh, and just to remind everyone, this is a this is a journey. This is a journey into a, a new energy future, and uh, and there uh, we may have to jump over some rocks to get there. There may be some level of discomfort in terms of what we need to do to to bridge that uh, that gap that takes us to the uh, to the to where we want to be with respect to clean energy. But but uh, understand this: the motives are pure. The uh, the uh, journey, at least as far as I am concerned, is resolute, and I want to see us get to uh, the end of this, and uh, and it will remain forevermore a bill that's worked on, uh, and that's why I say it's a journey, but uh, unless we start, we don't finish. Uh, hopefully, we've gotten a good start here, and we can keep plowing forward. Uh, hopefully, we'll, uh, we'll find that uh, 2020 is a one of those years within the history of the Minnesota legislature that uh, is an energy year and that has taken us uh, forward in a positive step. Thanks so much. Thank you, Senator Senjum. So sort of a preview of next week. Next week we have a renewable natural gas uh, bill that's being brought forward from Senator Weber. Uh, Senator Dames has an RDA expenditure bill that he would like to discuss. That's going to be Tuesday. Thursday, we will have um, PUC Commissioner Means, I believe is her name, uh, in for confirmation. I expect that to be fairly uh, straightforward. I believe she is a highly qualified individual, and I, don't, I did not see any problems with that nomination. Uh, so I expect us to move that through committee fairly quickly uh, and get it to the floor. Uh, then, of course, Thursday, we'll take this up. And if we do need additional time, we certainly can on this bill. Um, it is not is my intention to try and get through this and move it to finance on Thursday if we can. If we need additional time, then we need additional time. Um, the 25th, if you didn't see your email on the 25th, we will not have committee. Um, we, there's been a decision that uh, so that members in the rural areas can get to caucuses that night that uh, we will not hold our committee hearing meeting. Uh, that meeting was going to be on carbon sequestration, strangely enough. And uh, we're going to push that probably beyond first deadline, first deadline being the 13th. We do need to focus on getting bills out of here. Um, we will be, you also see on the Senate, uh, the Senate calendar, I think on Monday, I will have a motion to uh, claw back the uh, RDA spend bill from finance to do some modifications to it and hopefully send that off back off to finance and get it to the floor. So that's another preview that you'll see. Uh, with that, Senate file 1456 is laid over as amended for consideration next Thursday. And with that, this committee is adjourned.